It's no secret that in the last few years, utility companies have put up the cost of electricity by a pretty significant amount. And if you're someone who owns an EV, you might have noticed that the cost to charge, both at home and on the road, has also ticked up pretty substantially. Even if, for the most part, driving an EV is still substantially cheaper than driving an internal combustion engined car. But what if I told you just a few days ago, I earned nearly $20 by using my EV and my utility company paid me for the privilege. Have I piqued your interest? Well, <laughs> stick around and I'll explain everything. Although we have a pretty big solar array on the roof of this studio, which also happens to be the roof of my home, it's 15 kilowatt peak, we also tend to use a lot of power, as I have detailed plenty of times on this channel before. And while we do try to be as energy efficient as possible, turning off things when we don't need them, we also have a 2,000 square foot home come studio that is entirely powered, heated and cooled by electricity. Even our water and sewage, both off grid, need electrical power to operate properly. Of course, in the summer, when that 15 kilowatt peak solar array is generating upwards of 80 kilowatt hours of electricity per day, and our net grid consumption is somewhere between a negative figure and 20 kilowatt hours owing, our electricity bill is pretty small. In the winter though, well, if there's a really nasty day and the panels are covered in snow and we have our heating running full blast, we can easily consume upwards of 200 kilowatt hours in a single day, especially if we have multiple vehicles to charge up. We are in the process of cooking a large meal for the family, think Thanksgiving or Christmas, and we are also doing a lot of laundry. I know. We use a lot of power, probably an order of magnitude more than most people watching this. But I should also note that a substantial amount of that electricity, somewhere around 45 kilowatt hours a day, goes towards keeping the servers running in our server room. And while, yes, we don't use the servers 24 seven, our video servers, the ones that we use for all of the production work for this channel, and store all of the footage from these cameras, do need to run most of the time as there are maintenance tasks that regularly run in the background to make sure everything is healthy and happy. Running a ZFS scrub once a week, that takes the better part of an entire weekend. But you're not here to hear me moan about my electricity bill. You're here to learn about my electricity company and how it paid me to use my EV. Or more accurately, how my utility company paid me for not using electricity from the grid. And instead, I powered my home from my truck. That's right. Today, I am going to be talking about peak time rebates. For me, it's a program that allows my utility company to incentivize not using power during high demand periods. We're going to examine what it is, how it works, and just how my utility company can afford to pay me one dollar for every kilowatt hour of power I don't use. And of course, I'll also detail how, in my case, it works with my Ford F-150 Lightning pickup truck but I'll also explain how you don't actually even need an EV to benefit from such a program. First, what are peak time rebates? Peak time rebates or peak rebates, different utilities use different names, is essentially a group name for incentive programs that some utility companies offer their customers. It's a way to try and encourage their customers to either reduce their power consumption during peak periods or not actually use any power from the grid at all. 
Since not all utility companies offer it and details vary from region to region, you will need to check with your utility to see if they offer something similar to mine and exactly how that local program operates. But for ease of use for this video, I'm going to detail it from the perspective of someone who is a PGE customer. That's Portland General Electric, not PG&E, which is Pacific Gas and Electric a completely different utility company that's about 800 miles further south from me. In order for my peak time rebates to work, I need to have a smart meter, and that's true for most programs around the US. A smart meter is an electrical meter that sends data about your energy consumption, and if you generate your power generation, back to the grid in real time, or it sends it a few times a day. If your meter is one of those old timey style ones that someone has to physically get to in order to read, you won't actually be able to take part in such a program as there's no accurate way for your utility company to measure your consumption over a particular set period of time. Next, let's look at why they're actually needed. To explain this though, I also need to detail what a Pika power plant is and why they are needed. So utility companies are really good at planning. They in fact use a whole slew of different mathematical models and statistics to try and guess how much electricity the grid is going to need to, to supply to their customers to ensure that there are no brownouts. Of course, they are moments where demand for electricity is so high that there's not actually enough electricity being supplied to the grid to meet demand and the grid may stop working as it should. Anyway, these mathematical models, which also sometimes include some socioeconomic predictions, work through a series of peaks and troughs throughout the day. The morning peak period, of course, is one of the well-known ones and covers the period of time from around six in the morning through until about nine in the morning, when most people tend to get up, have a shower, make breakfast and head off to school and work. At the other end of the day, there's another peak period happens when people return home from school or work and start cooking their evening meal and carry out some of their evening chores. The level of accuracy of modelling is pretty phenomenal. The UK National Grid, for example, can even take into account sudden surges in demand caused by people flipping on a kettle to make a cup of tea in the middle of a football match or during a TV commercial break on a popular soap opera. And as impressive as this is, all of this modelling is essential because just as utility companies need to produce enough power to meet demand, they also need to make sure they're not producing excess power because too much power in the grid can screw things up just as badly as not enough. And while some excess power can be stored quite easily in a grid-tied battery backup system or can be used to pump water to the top reservoir in a pumped storage hydroelectric plant, the grid generally needs to closely mirror its generation with its consumption. So far, so good. And in most situations, local utilities have everything under control. The power stations are generally split into several different categories, ones that produce a consistent amount of power to satisfy the grid's base load, ones that operate at certain times of the day to meet a predictable demand, and these so-called Pika plants, which can be spun up quickly, often in as little as 10 minutes, to provide additional power as required by the grid. Pika plants can generate power in a number of different ways, but the most common type in operation today is a Pika plant that operates either gas turbines or massive internal combustion engines that also burn some form of natural gas. And while these systems can be online and producing power pretty quickly, the environmental impacts of those pika plants operating, they're not good. They are often located in industrial areas that abut low income residential neighborhoods, very often disenfranchised low income neighborhoods, 
And that means that pica plants can have a pretty detrimental effect on people's health. They tend to produce high levels of carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide, none of which are, of course, good for our lungs or the planet we live on. A recent study on the operation of pica plants inside New York City found that those plants' operation cost the citizens there the equivalent of $43 million a year in lost sick days, health impacts, and premature deaths. That's equivalent to $117,700 a day, or about 1.3 cents for every citizen of the city per day, per year. I think you can see here that pica plants aren't very environmentally friendly, and so in order to keep grid emissions low and abide by emissions regulations, utility companies are now trying to find alternative means to balance demand and supply. Additionally, when there are extreme weather events, such as a massive snowstorm, extreme cold, or a huge heat wave, the modeling carried out by utility companies often suggests that the utility company might not have enough capacity to meet demand, even with those pica plants in operation, and may find themselves having to buy in electricity from outside of their region or their general generating pool, something that adds significant expense, but also increases the strain on the electrical grid. And so they figure out ways to try and make that not happen by incentivizing their customers. If you are someone who uses time of use or cheap rate electricity, that is actually one of the various methods used by utility companies to incentivize your behavior to get you to shift your electrical consumption from periods of high demand to periods of low demand. By providing you with a lower charge for using power in low demand or off-peak periods, the utility company is ensuring that it doesn't have to power down baseload generation, something which can also be expensive and take a long time to accomplish, while also reducing theoretical peak demand periods intensity. Another solution is to use grid-tied energy storage products like massive power pack installations, be they built with new battery packs or recycled EV packs, allowing utility companies to store power generated during our low demand periods and then release it back to the grid during high demand periods, which again reduces grid strain. And of course, the next logical step down that road is using a customer's grid tied battery storage system, such as an individual's Tesla Powerwall. A virtual power plants, which is Tesla's name for being able to command a whole load of different customers' power walls and then simultaneously store and then feed back power to the grid when needed by the utility, has helped reduce pica plant use significantly in large parts of California. And here in the Portland PGE region, even though I don't think Tesla's operating virtual power plants here yet, I know some of you have individually allowed your power walls to feed a certain amount of power back to the grid every hour during a peak period event. Which brings me to how I earned money for not using power from my grid. My Ford F-150 Lightning, which we purchased last year, is capable of feeding power to my home in a power cut, thanks to the optional Ford Home Integration System, which I happen to own. Right now, as I record it, I've got to be honest, the home integration system isn't fully functioning yet. There's a major bug and it sometimes doesn't automatically turn on when required in a power cut. Apparently, a software update is on the way in the next few months that Ford engineers have promised will fix the system's issues and is fixing the system's issues in the lab right now. But even if you don't have a home integration system, the F-150 Lightning has up to 10 kilowatts of power takeoff from its onboard power sockets, courtesy of its Pro Power onboard inverter. 
technically it's 9.6, but 10 is close enough. And there are many other EVs coming to market today with similar vehicle to load functionality. From the latest generation of the Kia e Nero to fancier vehicles like the Genesis electrified G80, Rivian's entire range of EVs, and new Altium based EVs like the Hummer EV. My local utility sends me an email a day or two ahead of any predicted high use period, and it tells me that it's holding a peak time event. It then details in the email when the event starts and when it ends, so I know when I should refrain from pulling power from the electrical grid. In addition, the email promises to pay me $1 for every kilowatt hour of electricity I don't use, compared to a usual period of time on a similar day. Because it's actually cheaper to pay customers to not use power than it is to buy in extra generation capacity from outside generators, it's a win-win-win. It's important to note here that you can enrol to take part in such a program even if you don't have an EV. For example, you could enrol and when you reach a peak time energy event, you could just go out for a walk for a few hours and not use any power at home or use less power than you normally would. Or you could set up one of those backup battery solutions to keep your refrigerator running while you turn everything else off in the house. For me, I just flip the two breakers that connect my home to the grid and the AC side of my charging station to the home. Ford's home integration system gets convinced there's been a power cut and then it will start automatically feeding power to my home, at least when it works. And while the peak time event takes place, my home gets all of its power from my truck, which then, after I've flipped the breakers back later in the evening, can charge up long after the peak demand period has ended. Right now, because the home integration system is a little touchy, I do give myself a little extra time to coax the system into working, but in the future, I'm hoping it will be much easier to do. Another note, because I don't have my home integration system and my solar panels connected, although I could if I changed how my solar panels operate, when I flip that breaker, my solar panels stop generating. I'm hoping to fix that in the future. Of course, if you just have a more basic vehicle to load system instead of a whole home backup, you'd just need to run an extension cord or two from your car to the appliances you want to power. And if you are someone who is very DIY oriented, you could even do this same setup with an EV without vehicle to load if you're willing to install your own mains inverter under the hood. Although I should note here that you shouldn't do it to a Tesla, as I've heard, based on local anecdotal tales, that Tesla service gets very upset if you try and run a mains inverter from your Tesla. And of course, in the future, plenty of EV manufacturers, including Ford, General Motors, Volkswagen and others, are all promising that we will soon be able to use two-way power transfer to feed power back to the grid during peak demand periods, earning ourselves the same kind of rebates that a Tesla Powerwall or similar owner currently does. Right now though, well, my utility looked at the amount of power I'd normally use during that three hour window, about 20 kilowatt hours, and credited me on my bill at a rate of $1 per kilowatt hour that I didn't use. And that's pretty cool. And on that note, we are done with today's video. If you have comments, you can drop us a polite note below in the Discord chat room on Mastodon, or if you are a Patreon supporter, you can leave your thoughts in the comments there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin, and Swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling on my right is the list of amazing Charged Up supporters, and shoutouts go out to our V2G Patreon supporters. They are Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C., Hey Esker, John Tramal, Carl Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter 
Dillinger, Ray Jean Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Framgen, Stephen Williams, Taslet and the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Carl Hodgson, Chris Centaur, Denny Hyde, Lance Schlarl, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off-grid supporters. Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget that we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday on this channel. Plus on a Sunday, you'll find us on Take Two. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon. And as always, keep evolving. Next week is going to be my parents' wedding anniversary. Um, and unfortunately, my father passed away in 2001. And we miss him dearly. He died of a brain tumour. Um, but at this time of year, obviously, I'm thinking quite a lot about my my family and um, my parents. And today's classic Mac story comes courtesy of the very first computer that my parents purchased. It was a 1998 iMac. Uh, it was one of the Bondi Blue ones. And my parents had saved up to buy it from um, from Bonds in Norwich and they had gone in and they bought it and they brought it home and they purchased it so that they could keep contact with me when I was at music college um, but they kind of got it it was kind of basic I think 233 megahertz G3 um, stock amount of RAM and at some point in the future, we decided that it needed more memory. So my big sister, Susan, and I, um, Susan, unfortunately, also passed away um, not so long ago, um, 2018, I think she passed away uh, again of cancer. And I miss her every day. Uh, she and I decided that we were going to do this upgrade for my mum and dad. And if you've ever had to crack open an original... Bondi Blue iMac, you know that it's it's made of plastic and it, it's quite an in-depth process to get access to the memory upgrade slots. And um, we very fondly as a family remember that my dad was absolutely beside himself with worry as my sister and I were kind of breaking open this computer to install more memory. Um, according to my mother, both I and my sister hammed it up a little bit. I, I couldn't possibly comment. Um, but my dad did not relax until everything was back together and the computer was reassembled. My dad was a very, very smart person. He was not computer savvy. He had a very good mechanical mind, but he wasn't, you know, into electronics or electrical engineering or computers. And he just didn't get how the computer worked. And, um, yeah, I'm sorry, Dad. <laughs>